you probably don't want to talk about it. We just help you get there. All right. Chapter number three. Proverbs chapter three. Just two verses this morning. Verses nine and ten. tight schedule this morning. It'll help me out a lot to just get to the point. Proverbs chapter 3, two verses, verses 9 and 10. Trust that everyone has it. I'm reading from the New American Standard Version of the Bible. Good to see my uncle. Our long lost member, his daughter. Amen. I understand you got a job, you got a job. So I'm glad to see you this morning. Proverbs chapter 3, verses 9 and 10. I'm reading from the New American Standard Version of the Bible. Once you found it, you'll find where it's similar to these. Honor the Lord from your wealth and from the first of all your produce. Verse 10 says, so your bones will be filled with plenty and your vats will overflow with new wine. And I read it one more time just because I like reading my Bible. Honor the Lord from your wealth and from the first fruits of all your produce. Verse 10 opens with a result connecting word so that your bones will be filled with plenty and your vats will overflow with new wine. I want to preach this morning from the subject, a trustworthy investment. All right. You may take your seats. Thank you very much, ushers. You're certainly too kind. A trustworthy investment. We all know something about investments, don't we? You make good investments and sometimes you make bad investments. There's no guarantee that when you make an investment, it will come out the way you want it to come out. Here's a word that will show us how to make a trustworthy investment. In the summer of 2008, I decided that I was going to make a positive investment in my future by going to college. Like all first-time college students, I was required by the institution to take the necessary core courses in order to fulfill the requirements of my desired degree plan. One of the core courses that I was required to take was a course called History Before 1877. <laughs> First day of class was typically like any other first day of class. The student body walked into the class, took our seats, and waited for the professor to grace us with her presence. When the professor walked into the classroom and graced us with her presence, she did what professors normally do. She introduced herself to the class and then informed us that it was now our turn to introduce ourselves to the class. She then went around the classroom one at a time. For you college students, you know what I'm talking about. She went around the classroom one at a time and asked each and every one of us to stand up and introduce ourselves to our fellow classmates. In a class of about 30 plus students, we all stood up one at a time and introduced ourselves 
to our fellow classmates. Mm -hmm. But this first day of class had a twist to it, a twist that the student body was not ready for. After everybody had introduced ourselves to one another, the professor then asked each of us to stand up again and tell her what we expected to learn from the class and why. Nobody was prepared for this question. We had studied how we were going to introduce ourselves to the class. We knew how we were going to articulate our name. We knew how we were going to articulate what we were going to school for. But we had no idea what we were going to say about what we expected to learn from the class and why. All right. Nevertheless, the spotlight was on. The stage was set and the curtain was open. And there it was. Each one of us stood up one at a time. And because we were college students, we just felt the need to intellectually communicate why it was or what we desired to learn from the class and why. All right. One at a time, everybody standing up, telling the professor what we expected to learn from the class and why we expected to learn what we expected to learn. And after the last person had went, the professor stood in front of the classroom, much like I'm standing before you right now, and she explained to us that she was overwhelmed that each and every one of us expected something out of the class. Yet, she assured us that if we had paid our tuition to only learn what we expected to learn, she assured us that we would leave the class highly disappointed. She informed the class that if you paid all that money to come to this class only to learn what you want to learn, you will leave this class highly disappointed. Oh my. But while I cannot assure you that you will learn what you want to learn, I can assure you that you will learn what you need to learn. Come on now. You looking, but you ain't listening. Come on. I cannot assure you that what you signed up for, you are going to get, but I can assure you that when you leave this class of history before 1877, you will leave with everything that you need for history after 1877. Come on now. In a similar instance, Ladies and gentlemen, I have come to realize that for many years, decades, and even centuries, believers like you and I have honored God with our wealth only to receive what we want from God. In other words, ladies and gentlemen, I have grievously discovered that for many years, decades, and even centuries, believers like you and I have come before the presence of the Lord with singing, but not because we want to sing. We just trying to stir up something in the bank. For when we want something from God, we can go to him and say, God, you remember when I sung that song in the sanctuary? Oh my. We come before the presence of God with thanksgiving in our stressed arms, not because we want to, but just because we are trying to store up something. For when we need God, we can remind God what we did so God will give us what we want. But I stood up this morning to let somebody somewhere know that God is not your slot machine where you put a quarter in it and expect a thousand dollars to come out. God is not your ATM machine where you put in a uh, deposit and expect, out and expect to withdraw something out. God is not your stock market that you put in investments and hope to come out on top. Amen, amen. Come on then. You don't. Give to God, expecting God to give something to you. You give to God because of who He is. Amen, amen, amen. I hear you, brother, reverend, pastor, preacher. And I should give to God for who He is. But if I can't get nothing out of the deal, <laughs> what's the point of giving to God? Therefore, the natural question that arises out of the text, and I'm almost through, is why should you value God with your valuables? Mm. So 
the natural question that arises out of the text. If I can't get nothing from God, if there's no guarantee that if I do this for God, that God will do this for me, then what's the point? Why should I value God with my values? Come on, come on. Here, in our selected text, Proverbs chapter 3, verses 9 and 10, the Holy Spirit makes known to us why it is that both you and I should value God with our valuables. Are you interested? Come on, sir. Come on, please. You should value God with your valuables. Simply hear me and hear me clearly because God supplies all of your needs. Thank you, Lord. You should value God with your valuables because God supplies all of your needs. Did you hear what I said? God doesn't just supply some of your needs. God doesn't just supply half of your needs. God doesn't just supply three-fourths of your needs or one-third of your needs. God, the God that both you and I serve, God supplies all of your needs. Can I tell you what all means? All just simply means. Yeah. Oh. God supplies all of your needs. Proverbs chapter 3 verse number 9. Solomon instructs or commands his son to value God with everything that he owns. He instructs his son to value God with everything that he owns. Solomon opens Proverbs chapter 3, verse number 9, with the imperative command, honor the Lord. Yes, the word honor here in the text comes from a Hebrew word that literally means to make heavy. Uh -huh. To make heavy is a technical way of saying to make rich. To make rich is a fancy way of saying to make respectable. Rich people demand respect not because of who they are but because of what they have. You respect a rich person or you respect a person who has diamonds on their hands not because you know anything about them but you respect them just because you see the diamonds. You respect a person who wears name brand shoes not because you know they are a good person but you respect them just because you see the name brand shoes. You respect a person who wears fancy clothes because of what you see but lose what you have today and watch those people who respected you today spit on you tomorrow. We know that people respect people on based on how they look, which is why we try to look our best. We try to demand respect by the way we look. Solomon understood this concept. This is why he said, you ought to honor the Lord with your wealth. All right. You ought to make God heavy. You ought to make God honorable. You ought to make God respectable. You ought to make God be respected by other people. Yes, Lord. I know what you're saying because you Bible scholars and you are well acquainted with Psalm 24, verse number one, where David declares that God is honorable all by himself. God is respectable all by himself. Psalm 24, verse one says, the earth is the Lord's, the fullness thereof, and they that dwell therein. I hear what you're saying. If the earth belongs to God, and God, and everything in the earth belongs to God, and everybody in the earth belongs to God, what in the world can I give to God that will make him more honorable than he already is? But I suggest to you, if you would allow me to suggest to you this morning, that while you and I may know how honorable God is, while you and I may know how respectable God is, while you and I may know how worthy of the praise and glory God is, there is somebody out there in the world who doesn't know how honorable God is. And if they are ever going to know how honorable he is, you've got to show them. That's it. That's it. And how do you show them text answers? He says you ought to show them with your wealth. All right. All right. I well, got you. you ought to make God honorable yeah. with your wealth. Yeah. Over the years, I 
started to skip this illustration. Come on. But Rawson ain't here, so I can say it. <laughs> Over the years, I developed a great respect. I'm trying to say this without crying. I developed a great respect for my eldest sister, Letitia. Amen. In the fall of 1999, my mother passed away. And I didn't have anywhere to go, but my oldest sister, Letitia, took me in. She took me in with two kids of her own and one on the way. She took me in and she gave me my own room. I was on her phone too much, so she got me my own phone. I didn't have nothing to wear, so she took me and she bought me some clothes. Everything she bought her children, she bought little brother. When she went to the corner store to get Frito pies and cheap soda water, she came back with little brother a Frito pie and cheap soda water. When she went to the store to buy her kids some clothes to go to school, she also went to the store to buy little brother some clothes to go to school. When she took her kids to school, she took me to school. When she gave her kids some money for lunch, she gave little brother some money for lunch. And it was then that I made up in my mind that if ever I got in a position to help my sister, that I would do whatever I can to help her because of what she did for me. but you ain't listening. God did, does everything for us. And if we got good sense to honor somebody who only supplies our terrible needs, we ought to be able to honor God who supplies our Thank eternal God. needs. Thank God. Yes, sir. God supplies all of our needs. We ought to honor God as Solomon instructed his son. But how do you honor God? Text says, you ought to honor God with your wealth. Wealth, here in the text, refers to what you worked hard for. Solomon essentially gives us two ways to honor God. He says you ought to honor God with your wealth. And you also ought to honor God with the first fruits of all of your produce. First, Solomon says you ought to honor God with your wealth. Wealth refers to what you worked hard for. Every morning, early in the morning, most of us, get up and go to what we call a J-O-B. Where we spend 8 to 12 hours a day working our fingers to the bone just to make sure that we can keep a roof over our heads. We work 8 to 12 hours a day, 5 days a week, just to make sure we can keep food on the table. We work our fingers to the bone just to make sure that we can keep clothes on our back. And Solomon says that everything that you work for is not necessarily for you. That's it. You worked for it. But Solomon says, if you got good sense, you ought to set something aside to give honor to the Lord. If you walk around looking good, then your God ought to look as good as you look. If you walk around smelling good, then your God should smell as good as you smell. If you walk around flaunting, yourself, then your God should be able to walk around and flaunt himself, but he can't do it if you don't honor him with your wealth. All right. All right. Your wealth is what you work hard for. Come on. You ought to honor God with what you work hard for. But Solomon gives us a second way to honor God. He says you ought to honor God from the first fruits of your produce. 
First fruits of your produce has nothing to do with what you worked hard for, as wealth does, but it has everything to do with what God has given you. First fruits of your produce has nothing to do with what you worked for, but it has everything to do with what God has given you. The biblical days when God was getting ready to bring the children of Israel into the promised land, the land of Canaan, that land that was overflowing with milk and honey, Deuteronomy chapter 6, somewhere around verses 10 and 11, God, before God used Joshua to bring the children of Israel into the promised land, God used Moses to remind the children of Israel that when I bring you to this land, you go have you go find houses that are full of food. You go find wells you did not dig. You go find vineyards you did not plant. In other words, you go find a whole lot of stuff that you didn't work for. I'm just going to give it to you. And when I give it to you, God says, I want you to give me the first fruits of what you find. All right. It's not what you work for. It's what God has given you. I know what you're saying. Everything I got, I work for. Everything I got, I work for. But can I correct your theology real quick? You might have worked for that TV on your wall. You might have worked for those clothes on your back. You might have worked for that car you drive, but you ain't did nothing for good health and strength. You might have worked for everything that you have, but you ain't did nothing to be clothed inside your right frame of mind. You may have worked for everything but that you have, but you ain't did nothing for God to wake you up this morning. And you ought to use what you work for and what God gave you to honor him. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. If God gave you some hands, you ought to clap them. If God gave you some feet, you ought to stop them. If God gave you a mouth, you ought to shout hallelujah to his name. You ought to use what you work for and you ought to use what you have, what God gave you to honor him. Amen. That's all right. That's all right. Solomon says, you ought to honor God with your wealth. You ought to honor God with the first fruits of all your produce. You have what you have because God supplies your needs. You couldn't go to work if God didn't wake you up. You wouldn't have what you have if God didn't give you what you needed in order to have what you have. You ought to honor, you ought to value God with your valuables because God supplies all of your needs. And not only should you value God with your valuables because God supplies all of your needs. But lastly, and I'm through, you should value God with your valuables because God sustains all of your needs. Thank you, Lord. Not only does he supply your needs, but he will make sure that you always have what you need. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Text says in verse number 10, Solomon assures his son that God will sustain all those who value him. God will sustain all those who value him. Yes. Don't misunderstand verse number 10. Verse number 10 is not a promise of prosperity. Verse number 10 is not a promise that is to say if you give to God that God will make you rich. That is not what the scripture is saying. God never promises you prosperity. God never promises you that you will be rich. God never promises you that you will live in a two-story house or drive a $500,000 car. That's not what God promised you. God never promised you what you want, but he did promise you that you will always have what you need. Thank you, Lord. Yes, sir. Solomon says God will sustain all those who, who value him. Interestingly, the very reason that Solomon gives 
for us to value God with our valuables is the very reason many believers like you and I don't honor God with our values. Solomon says, if you give to God, God will sustain your needs. Yes, we say, my needs are already met. I'll sustain them. <laughs> oh my. Solomon says, not so. You need God not only to supply your needs, but you also need God to sustain your needs. Amen. Solomon says in verse number 10 that you ought to value God with your valuables. You ought to honor God from your wealth and from your first fruits so that here is the guarantee. Here is the trustworthy investment so that your barns will be filled with plenty. Mm -hmm. You ought to value God with your valuables so that your barns will be filled with plenty. A barn here in the Old Testament was an underground storehouse. It was where a person would put their grain or their seeds. All right. They would put it underground and they would cover it up with dirt so that it would be invisible to, the, to, the, to a person walking by so they wouldn't break in and steal what they had. Uh -huh. A barn that is filled is a sign of prosperity. A barn that is empty is a sign of famine or judgment. Solomon says you ought to value God with your valuables so that your barns would be filled. This has little to do with having a lot as much as it has to do with having a constant supply. All right. Hear me again. This doesn't mean that Literally, your barns will be overflowing with stuff, but it does mean that when you wake up in the morning, you'll have something to eat. It ain't All nothing right. but black folk Thank in here, and I know that black folk have always got something in the cabinet. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> it, it might not be what you want, but it, it's something in there that you can whip up and make you something to get you full. And the truth be told, my grandfather would say, you don't eat for enjoyment, you just eat to get full. <laughs> It has nothing to do with having a lot, but it does have something to do with having something. Yes. Yes. Text says God not only supplies your needs, but God will sustain your needs. Which simply suggests, ladies and gentlemen, that you might not have what you want, but you got some bean and wheat in there. Let's throw some rice on top of it. Go in there, get you some faucet water, and you got what you need. Yeah. <laughs> so God sustains and God supplies. Amen. He says that your bones will overflow with plenty. We so oftentimes neglect to give to God because we are worried about our needs being met. Mm -hmm. All right. But Jesus, in Matthew chapter 6, somewhere around verses 25 and 26, assures us that we should never worry about our needs being met. Is that Bible reading here? Matthew chapter 6, verses 25 and 26, there Jesus gives his famous anxiety statement. Matthew chapter 6, he says, what you worried about? Look at the birds of the air. They just fly around all day. They don't sow nothing and they don't reap nothing. But God continues to give them worms from the ground. He says, aren't you more important to God than some birds? If you are more important to God than some birds, then you ought not worry about if you got enough after you give to God because the text says that God will always make sure you got what you need. Right. Come on now. It says you ought to value God with your valuables mm -hmm. so that your bones will always have what they need. 
Go always have what you want. I'm going to have some fun here and I'm going to take my seat. Not only should you value God with your valuables, so your bones will be filled with plenty. Is your Bible still open? I plan on preaching from Come on. <laughs> but you should value God with your valuables because so that your vats will overflow with new wine. Right. I'm just going to shoot you down with that new wine statement in a minute, but let me first deal with vats. <laughs> You know what a vat is? A vat is simply a large container. Right. It's simply a tub or a tank that holds or stores liquids. Uh -huh. They had what they called a wine press. Uh -huh. Wine press was where you put all your grapes <laughs> and you squeeze the juice out of them. And once you squeeze the juice out of them, you would put a vat underneath so that the vat, the container, the tank could catch the juice. Uh -huh. He says, you are to honor God with your valuables so that your bones will be filled, but you also should honor God with your valuables so that your vats will overflow with new wine. Bones deal with physical food. Vats deals with something to drink to go with your food. Uh -huh. A vat catches the liquid. Mm -hmm. It stores the liquid. But he says that your vats may be filled with new wine. Mm -hmm. This is not your ticket to say that God encourages me to drink wine. <laughs> All right. This is not your ticket that God said on, that he was going to overflow my tanks. <laughs> with some new wine. Yeah. Right. No, 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 no. This is where biblical context and culture and background study comes into play. Come on. Right. New wine has nothing to do with an alcoholic beverage. All right. All right. And, and All let right. me say it again. You got this on tape, Sean? New wine All right. has absolutely, positively nothing to do with an alcoholic beverage. Let me put it to you another way. You need something to drink. You don't need alcohol to drink. Come on, man. I said God supplies your needs and God sustains your needs. Hint, you don't need alcohol. You Amen. want alcohol. Amen. God is not obligated to supply what you want, but he is obligated to supply what you need. Here's what the text is saying. In order to make wine, you don't just squeeze a grape and get wine. You got to squeeze the grape and then you have to mix the grape juice with some kind of altering substance and then you got to let it sit a while. Yeah. And then after it sits a while and the sugar inside the grape is transformed into that stuff that intoxicates you. All right. <laughs> <laughs> then you got some wine. Come on, preacher. But the text doesn't say old wine uh -huh. that has sat a while. Uh -huh. The text says new, new wine. wine. Yeah, yeah, right. Let me give you the Clement Hall translation of that. New wine means fresh wine. Yes. Yeah, yeah. The text will literally, literally read fresh juice. Yes. In the biblical culture, juice was typically a part of their meal. Uh, right. Not wine. <laughs> juice. juice. <laughs> Speak now. It was typically a part of their meal. You know, like you have a soda with your meal, or you have juice with your meal, or you have water with your meal. They had juice, grape juice, with their meal. Breakfast, grape juice. Lunch, grape juice. Dinner, grape juice. They had with their meal. God says, not only will I supply food for you, I'll also supply something for you to drink. With right. your food. Thank you, Lord. Not to intoxicate you, but so that you can have something to drink with your food. Mm. Yes, sir. Why not water? Water in the biblical days was often contaminated with other kind of substances. In many instances, in many locations, it was not safe to drink. Uh -huh. But grape juice was. Come on. <laughs> Come on. All right. 
you get where I'm going with this. Don't oh, yes, sir. God supplies your needs, but God will sustain your needs. Uh -huh. Not only will he sustain your bones with food, but he will also sustain your faucets with drink. Come on. Fresh wine. Fresh. Fresh grape juice. <laughs> Fresh food. Mm -hmm. That's new every morning. Every. This is why you shouldn't go to bed worrying about what you go eat tomorrow. You ought to wake up knowing that God said that he will give me something fresh to eat. God said that he will give me something fresh to drink. So I'm not going to worry about what God is going to do because he said right here in his word that I may not have what I want, but I will have what I need. Thank you, Lord. I want a steak, and all I got is baloney. <laughs> God will supply our needs. Yes, he you ought to value God with your valuables. Because God will always make sure that you have what you need. Thank you, Lord. You shouldn't worry about if I give this to God then I won't have enough to meet my obligations. Mm -hmm. The text says God will always make sure that you have what you need. Not what you want, but he will give you what you need. Thank you, Lord. You want a BMW, but all you really need is a car. Yes, thank you, Lord. You want a two-story house, but all you really need is a place to lay your head. Thank you, Jesus. God is not obligated to give you what you want. Yes, sir. But he promises to always give you what you need. Mm -hmm. I'm through with all I've been trying to tell you in this short time we spent together. Is that you and I should value God with our valuables. Because God supplies all of our needs. And not only does God supply all of our needs, but you and I should value God with our valuables because God sustains all of our needs. Amen. After 16 weeks of sitting in history before 1877, I walked out of that class with the understanding that my teacher was absolutely right. History before 1877 did not teach me what I wanted to know, but it did teach me what I needed to know. All right. In a real sense, ladies and gentlemen, that's all I've really been trying to get you to understand this morning. That when you give to God, when you honor God with your valuables, you will not necessarily get what you want, but you will get what you need. Thank you. May God bless you and may God keep you.